Did you know that you could actually miss a friend that you never had? I read the most incredible article, and then I, w- I thought it was ridiculous at first, but then I read it and I realized it's totally true. And it's talking about all the, because of COVID, because of the long-term uh, isolation, because of the masks that we wear, all the acquaintances you used to do small talk with, you kind of don't do that anymore. Maybe you had a favorite barista at the coffee, that coffee shop, and used to say a couple words and you do a little bit of banter. They're not doing that anymore because the, ma- the mask makes it difficult to communicate. Maybe a checker where you buy your food or someone helping you at the lumber store. Maybe you're a barber or your hairdresser. People are having a lot less conversations because it's just frustrating to talk through the mask. And they're discovering that this, these acquaintances are really missed. And now people are getting depressed because they missed the friends they never had. <laughs> the acquaintances. And even now, the men... We're kind of doing okay. Now the men are starting to struggle because they used to be a, guys would connect by the millions around the country around sports. You'd chill at maybe your favorite uh, you know, sports diner or maybe over your friend's house or a couple of acquaintances would get together or maybe the constant banter about sports you did. Guys are missing all of the, the little small talk that we do with our acquaintances that are actually... we didn't realize we're kind of like distant friends. And so guys are struggling. Just the other day, my wife and I were somewhere, and we were at a coffee shop, and the owner, I just happened to wear a a shirt that had my team on it, which didn't make it to the Super Bowl, but my quarterback did. (laughs) And um, he goes, oh, you're da da I'm from da da And he starts talking football. And I go, oh. And I start talking football. And I thought we were going to cry and hug each other. It's like, (laughs) oh. I just miss talking. I love sports. Of course, we didn't because we're guys. And we, at the end, we just kind of went like, hey, yeah, you know, good luck in the Super Bowl. But I had forgotten how much I missed the banter of acquaintances. And it reminded me of the power of the gospel in every single person we meet. That even now, we're beginning to realize Everybody, even the people we have these little short conversations with, they matter. And they matter a lot more than we realized. And because you can't really see people's expressions through the masks, it's just like, why bother? You're just doing your job, getting it done, and going on. And I just want to encourage us that in this new era that we are in, We're going to have to retrain ourselves to re-engage, not just with close friends, with the friends we never had, with the acquaintances that we meet as we go through our days, to begin to learn again small talk, what that's all about, the power of saying something that may encourage someone for the entire day, or perhaps they will encourage you. For the entire day. And as we're finishing up our series and finishing up our 21 days of prayer, I think asking directions is more important than ever. We started with listen, learn, and leap. Listen to the voice of God, learn what He's saying, and leap by faith into planning with certainty in the midst of uncertainty. We talked about are you reading the signs? Are you paying attention to the signs around you? Are you preparing for this new era and today, clarity and confusing times? Apparently, I haven't worn this jacket for a while because when I was worshiping, I felt something and I pulled this out and it was a picture of me and my beautiful redhead that we took here at the end of the 2020 21 Days of Prayer at a photo booth when we were actually allowed to be close together during that time. It was called the Year of Jubilee. We looked so happy then. (laughs) I had way less gray in my beard at the beginning of that year. You never know how a year will turn out. But it's amazing that in this new year, in this new era, God's going to give us opportunity to see with credible clarity when everybody else sees confusion. 
And the beautiful part of paying attention to what God is saying is knowing that every time he gives a sign, whether it's supernatural or natural, it is a sign designed to protect you from the enemy and to help propel you forward on the destiny he has for your life and for his master plan for all humanity. Now, if you have your notes, go to the New Testament uh, point. It's called New Testament Signs Confirm and Confound. And if you're joining us online, there's a lot of notes here. I'm not getting through maybe half of them. But the, the, good, the good news is if you go to our website at Valley Christian Center, vccfresno.org, and download our app, you can get my sermon notes. So I'm going to only hit a few of them today, but you definitely want to get our app and follow along because I'm giving you a lot of instances in the New Testament where these signs and wonders were, were, were created to help the body of Christ. And you don't want to miss these. You want to pay attention to these because they're going to happen all around you. And they're both natural and supernatural. And we'll cover this as we go along. The first one comes from Matthew 16, 3. It says, And in the morning, and this is Jesus talking, by the way, to the Pharisees and the Sadducees. In the morning, and in the morning, it will be stormy today, for the sky is red and threatening. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. The Pharisees and the Sadducees refused to believe that Jesus was truly the Messiah. They, they were annoyed that he had followers. They thought, he's just the son of Joseph, a carpenter. He's a nobody. What is this nobody doing telling people about of God. And so they demanded a sign from heaven from him. And he said, no, I'm not giving you a sign. He says, you guys can read the signs. You guys can read the signs. You can see. Remember that saying, red at the morning, sailor uh, take warning, red at night, sailor's delight? He's saying, you guys have figured out how to read the worldly signs, but you have no clue about the spiritual signs. Jesus came as an answer to the prophecies of the ancient prophets, and yet they could not see it. And so he's, he, basically, that's no different today than it was then. The signs for the world who has not, do not yet know Christ or have rejected Christ confound them. They're just a, a natural sign. They can't see the meaning behind it. He goes on in the same instance, but in, in Luke chapter 11, 29 and 30, he continues with the same story. He says, when the crowds were increasing, he began to say, this generation is an evil generation. It seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah. For as Jonah became a sign to the people of Nineveh, so will the Son of Man be to this generation." Now they're thinking to themselves, what does a man in the belly of a fish have to do with anything? They're looking at Jesus like, what is this all about? But he's casting a vision for the disciples and his followers so that when he dies and he's in the tomb for three days, they get it. That God structured a plan thousands of years ago with this bizarre incident where someone who was waiting Bird ended up being stuck in the belly of a whale, but was redeemed at the end. And he's showing how Jesus came for the wayward world. And after he was crucified and after he died, he spent three days in the tomb, and then the stone rolled away, and Jesus was resurrected. And so he's confounding his enemies, but he's and he's confusing the opposition. But he is revealing to you what you should do. Don't underestimate the power of God to have you in a room with people that don't believe in Jesus and something happens and you instantly see the spiritual relevance of what's going on. Maybe you sense God speaking. You sense a demonic activity. You sense a presence of something. And they're all clueless. But you are reading the signs. It is God's way of removing the obstacles of the enemy 
and of the world so you may go quicker on the pathway toward the destiny he has for your life. Just as he is doing to bring Jesus to to this thing to the conclusion where Jesus returns. I have my be happy cup today, by the way. Be happy. I got to talk sports with somebody. I'm happy. So Jesus will give a sign that will both confound the enemy of God, confound the the ones who oppose you, and then give relief and direction and peace to you. That's the power of what Jesus does. Let's look at now this one. I love this one. This is one that confirms the deity of Jesus. This comes from a wedding that Jesus attended with his wife, I mean his wife, his mother. <laughs> different, different religion. His, his mother. <sighs> and the disciples. John 2.11, it says this. It says that this is the first of his signs Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. What was the sign? What was the first sign? Stop whining. No, just kidding. <laughs> Wine. Okay, now it's funny that we, we are a nation that had prohibition, right? And I heard someone say once, you know, uh, Jesus' first miracle turned water into wine, and the woman who came out of the prohibition era said, yeah, we still are still upset with him about that one. <laughs> we struggle with this. But listen, we, we miss the power of this. He's at this wedding, and at a wedding, you brought out the best wine first to the guests, and then after they had plenty of wine and they couldn't taste very well, you gave them the cheap stuff. That's what they did. And so he's there with his mother, and his mother's like, hey, Jesus, we ran out of wine. And he's like, okay, this is not my time, well, why? but it's his mother, right? He's not, but it's like when your mom says to do something, you do something, okay? He loved his mom. And so she said, there's no more wine. And so he, he says, okay, let's look around and see what we got to work with. And they find these, these six 30-gallon water containers, big stone water containers, not little pitchers you have on a table. They carried 30 gallons each, six. He has them fill it to the brim with water. He prays, and it turns into wine. Not just any wine, not the cheap stuff on the, on the lower shelf, the good stuff that they keep behind the locked up in the back. The good stuff, and the master of the house is blown away. Now let me l- look at, if you have 36 gallon containers, that's 180 gallons of wine. How many bottles of wine can you get out of one gallon? Who can tell me? You can put it on the comments if you're joining us at home. How many? Maybe some of you are drinking right now as you're watching me. <laughs> Look on the side of the bottle. Report back. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> They're home with their three kids, you know, for a week. Maybe it's something harder than that. Put it, put it away. Listen to the message. <laughs> Anybody guess how many bottles of wine out of one gallon of wine? Five. Five. That's 900 bottles of wine. He made the equivalent of 900 bottles of wine. And this is profoundly significant because what he's showing them is a precursor of the wine that he held in the communion on the Last Supper when he talked about his blood. He said the master was blown away. There was enough wine for everyone and then some left over. When Jesus shed his blood on the cross, referred to his blood as the wine on the Last Supper, he said, I'm pouring this out for the many. The first miracle he ever did was not about wine was about an abundance of the best of the best of the best that could be given for everyone. That's what it was. And so when he shed his innocent blood on the cross, it was enough to cover the sins of any who call upon his name. For then, for now, and until he returns. That is the beauty of understanding the signs of what God does. And so the disciples 
when they encountered that, they thought, that's really cool. He makes great wine. But then the Last Supper, they see the correlation of wine to blood, and then they see him give his life and shed his blood as the one sacrifice for all humanity, and they get it. They get the sign. I'm telling you that you're going to see more of these happen. You're going to begin to pinpoint these and see they fit in this new era. I am incredibly proud of those of you who are going through the Bible in the year. And and, and especially you gals, you're blowing the doors off it. You're all signing up. You're going through the whole Bible in a year. You're you're commenting on it. It's incredible. And I, I just believe that as you're reading the Word of God every day, He's going to quicken to you to your mind the things that he said that didn't make sense before, but in this new era, it's going to give you clarity while others have confusion. It's going to make more sense than you ever imagined. That's what that means. And that is for me today. But another one that we need to remember is that When God gives us these signs, they call out counterfeits. Oh, this is big. Mark 13, 22. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, the elect. There is going to be a lot of people calling out signs and wonders, and they're going to be wrong. I want to remind us of something that just happened, and I think God allowed it to happen to help us recenter ourselves with wisdom. I was being sent an, unto- an ungodly amount of emails from many of you and others on Facebook and emails and texts about all the prophets about what was going to happen in this election. Now, in the old days, what would they do to a false prophet when it didn't come true? They'd kill him or her. I want to warn us to not get caught up in the public opinion of our culture and try to twist God's arm by using the gift of prophecy to try to get our way, our guy or our girl or our this or our that. Prophecy is not about trying to get uh, your business or politics or whatever to a higher level. Prophecy is about calling the people of God closer to the Messiah. And prophecy is important, but we're going to see more and more false prophets rise up. It's going to sound almost right. right? It's going to sound like just about right. It reminds me of the Rolex that I bought for $18 in Cambodia. It looked like a Rolex. It ticked like a Rolex. And it made it all the way home till it stopped working forever. I got my $18. I got to impress people on the plane for, for you know, for the 14-hour tw- flight. And then it stopped working. It almost looked right, but it was a fake imitation. There's going to be a lot of signs coming up, but to you who are listening God will give you clarity in the confusion. You're going to go, you know, that looks and sounds almost right. And that should be the Holy Spirit saying, go back to Scripture. What does Scripture say? If it's almost right, it's not right. The Word of God is the one truth that has sustained itself from generation to generation to generation. And in this new era... Our success or our failure is going to be how much we dare to stick to the Word of God. Our success or failure, our growth or our, or our death as the body of Christ, as individual churches, will be dependent upon whether or not we embrace these false prophets and the almost, almost right statements that make us accepted in culture, or whether or not we stick the Word of God 
as it stated because God breathed it into the men who wrote it. It was inspired by the Holy Spirit, and it is good for teaching. It is good for reproof. It is good for everything. It will not change. Hold the standard. And if you hold that standard, you will be able to call out the counterfeits because it may be close, but you've got to know, you know what? It's not close enough. It's not close enough. That's important. It calls out counterfeits. Also, signs clarify our seasons. It clarifies our seasons. Matthew 24, 32 says this. From the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as the branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. Remember I said that we have seasons of our life, and we go through many of them. We have these periods of our life that go through decades, and then we have eras that go through generations. Each of you, in the midst of all of this, through the new era, you have individual seasons. And you've got to know what season it is. And Jesus said, if you see the fig leaf come out, and you see the fruit begin to start, you know in, a, in so many weeks there's going to be a harvest. But that means that there are seasons. There are times when you have to just sow in the ground something that was once alive that's now dead. If you take a peach, and you take the peach that's ripe off the tree, and you shove it in the ground, it's going to be a long time if it ever grows anything. The peach must die or be consumed, and the seed must dry out. And only after the fruit is dead and the seed seed is dried out and it looks like it's useless, then you plant that and God grows something new. I want you to hear me on this because this is the painful part. Some of the things you've been doing are dead. You don't want to admit it, but they're dead. They're moldy, they're old, they're antiquated, they're dead. But it it still looks edible. No, it isn't edible anymore. It's dead. Let it die, but preserve the seed. Because for everything you've invested in your whole life, everything you've ever done, even though that season ends, there's a seed of hope. God uses what you learned. And if you sow it, something new will grow. The challenge is, in the get-it-now world, where everything is instantaneous, we don't like waiting. And so we don't like something we put our hands to to die, even though God's going to make something even better from the seed. We don't like having to look at the ground and wait. We don't like, when it finally sprouts, having to nurture it and take care of it and prune it. That's hard work. Hear me now, this this is... I'm just telling you, in this new era, there's a lot of hard work to be done. We've kind of been on the waiting. We sowed something. We're watching things die. And we're kind of like, well, we really can't go full speed ahead. But to get to the next level, we're going to have to invest heavily. It's going to take something of us. We're going to have to make a decision. How much of my time am I going to spend investing in what God has asked me to do? Or how much of my time am I going to invest in scrolling through Facebook, scrolling through Netflix, binge watching, binge eating, binge drinking, whatever? It's going to take some hard work. And if you dare to put that in, he's going to give you clarity in your next season. It's going to begin to open up. We had something crazy happen this week. We saw some amateur investors take on some big, giant, billionaire hedge funds by using technology and and a a social media platform to shoot a particular stock through the roof. So ticked off I don't own that stock. But anyway, they worked together. It was like like an in-your-face to the billionaire thing, right? And they made hundreds of millions of dollars, these amateurs, and they made these billionaire hedge funds basically lose most, almost all their money. It was all done on a social platform by sharing information. Now, there's a lot of moral issues of what they did. 
is a lot of moral issues of what people have been doing. But that's not the point. The sign is this. People have found a way to get a voice. Just because they found a way, they got a voice. And just because you're not a billionaire hedge fund, hedge fund manager, you could take you a little bit of money and talk to other people and suddenly you all made money. How much more should the people of God think about how the, the power of our voice, if we actually work together and found ways not to waste our time on social media, but use the technology that God has given us through others to reach every corner of the world for Jesus. That's capable right now. I believe God is showing us a sign, a sign of the end times. We just got to pay attention to it and use it for good and not let it be used for evil. What is your season? What's happening in your life? Are you in the sowing season, harvest season, the pruning season? Pay attention because not only are there signs, are there signs leading the world to the understanding that Christ is returning, but there are signs specifically for your life. What are those signs? They also convict and convert. 1 Corinthians 14, 22. Thus tongues are a sign, not for believers, but for unbelievers. While prophecy is a sign, not for unbelievers, but for believers. What does that mean? Remember when Peter had the great uh, evangelical outreach where the Holy Spirit fell and thousands were saved and people were praising God in other tongues. They were praising God in languages that were not their own. People were paying attention and going, you're not from my country, you're not from my region, you're not from... How, how are you praising God in my language? He used tongues to convince the unsaved that God was real and they were praising God with these supernatural tongues. He's saying these are for the unbelievers. That's why we are careful how we use them here. We don't just get up and begin to speak with tongues on stage because unless someone interprets it, it's just, it just babble. And so we have to be careful how we use it. But it also convicted those who needed to follow Christ. And prophecy is not for unbelievers but for believers Prophecies should always direct you with clarity toward what God is saying to you. Prophecy is for those who are already following God, listening for the signs, and they, the prophecy should either warn you or direct you. That's why Acts 2.17 is so important. Because in the latter days, He gives us dreams and visions to help one another. And maybe in this season, you're going to begin to walk out that gift that you've been afraid to walk out, and God's going to be able to give you the ability to interpret people's dreams or to give them encouraging words or great cautions of things that they, couldn't, they didn't see. And then, this is important, it cements our authority. Mark 16, 17 through 19 says this. Listen, this is for you. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up serpents with their hands. And if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. So then the Lord Jesus, after he spoke to them, was taken up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. This was after he resurrected. He came back one final time, an encore performance, to say, just to remind you, I'm going, but I'm empowering you when I leave. Are we going to choose in this new era to walk out this as we get closer to the generation which sees the return of Christ? He gives more and more power to his children. Are you going to choose to walk it out? I'm going to ask the prayer team to make their way around the sanctuary. Because we believe that when we are empowered by the Holy Spirit and someone asks for prayer and we pray for them, 
that God not only hears that prayer, but when we say be healed in Jesus' name, they can be healed in Jesus' name. And I keep saying this every week, and thank you so much for responding online. If you are sick, if someone in your family is sick, God is not stuck in this sanctuary. God is above everything. If you are sick and you have a prayer request, write it in the comments. Allow us the privilege to pray a blessing over you and your family. You can be healed right where you are watching. So please, be courageous and put in your prayer request. It cements your authority. While others feel powerless, you gain authority and power. That was the promise of Jesus. The closer we get to his return, the more power we're going to get. I want to read Matthew 24, 14 at the end. The sign that Christ will return. It says this, And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Do you know how close we are to that happening? Do you know how close we are to being able to bring the good news to the whole world? Every corner and every language, we are this close. So you better believe that in this new era, he's going to empower you, direct you, give you clarity. You're going to begin, to begin to push things out of your life that you didn't really care about anyway. Things that took up your time. And you're going to be, begin to walk with a new power and a new authority and a new clarity for you. Now that only works if you choose to follow Jesus. And I want to give you a chance today. And those of you joining us, fine. If you have yet to follow Jesus, you're not right with God. The sin, our own sin, the sin of humanity, can commune with a perfect God. It just can't. I don't care how many rules you write down and obey. Sin, our wrongdoings, separate us with this chasm between you and God that only Jesus can fill. When Jesus came, he came as the Son of God, all man, all God. And he freely died for everything you have ever done and ever will do. He gave himself and said, I will take the death penalty for this child. And he died for you. And all you have to do is ask God to forgive you because of the sacrifice of his son Jesus, and he will. And so I'm going to ask right now, if you close your eyes, and if you're here today, and if you're, if you're joining us at home, I'm going to ask you to make a commitment today. If you have decided that, you know what, I want to walk with God. I want my sin to be gone. I want to know I'm right with God. This is your moment. This is your time. This is your day. So you can begin this day toward eternity, knowing you are forgiven of everything. He's, he will wash you clean and take away all your sin. And if you want to receive Jesus Christ today, let me know right now by putting your hands up. Be brave. Put it up. Good. Come on. Good. Who else? Put it up high so I can see. And you at home, put it in the comment. Yes, Pastor. I'm going to walk with Jesus. Good. You can put your hand down now. I'm going to ask you to pray a prayer with me. And then after we're done, if you're here in the sanctuary, come talk to our prayer team members at home. After this prayer, tell, tell us online. I said yes, and we'll send you something, we'll call you, and we'll pray for you. But there's a prayer that we do to confess our sins, and we've done it many times here. We know how it's done, and we're going to pray it out loud together. You pray with me as you begin this journey. You ready? Heavenly Father, I ask you to forgive me of all the things I've done. I believe you love me. I believe you sent Jesus. I believe he died for me. And he rose again. Wash me and make me new. Give me a new heart and a new mind. And help me serve you in this life. And praise you for eternity in the next. 
And it's in your son, Jesus, I pray. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. And now I'm going to ask you all to stand with me because I believe right now God's going to do miracles. He's going to do miracles in some of you if you dare to ask. And our prayer team members are unafraid of anything you can throw at them. They've never said, no, nah, that's too hard for me. Come back next week. Maybe you got something that's been gnawing at you forever, a relationship that's been going bad forever, or a sickness that just won't go away, or something that's confusing you. Go to the people of God. Let them use their spiritual authority to give you clarity. But you have to ask. Faith means you ask believing. you got to ask. And so when I dismiss you, those of you who know you need to receive the power and impartation of prayer. Don't leave without it. And those of you who are joining us, put it online right now. I see you doing it right now. I can see the comments. Put your prayer request online. God will go right where you are and hear you. Keep listening it online because I can see it now. Thank you for doing that, by the way. Thank you for listening to your prayer request. Put your hands over your heart. I'm going to pray a blessing and I'm going to dismiss you. Father, thank you that we have the privilege of living in this time. I'm so thankful that every man and woman hearing my voice was called by you to be part of your plan. You've left nobody behind. Thank you, God. You didn't leave us behind. And I pray, Lord God, they are encouraged today that they be willing to do the hard work of re-engaging themselves with a community that's isolated and scared and alone. And that in this time, Lord God, you would heal their hearts of any brokenness or any pain or any anxiety and you would replace it with joy. In Jesus' name, I pronounce that blessing upon my brothers and sisters. And if you receive it, say amen. amen. God bless you guys. Have a great week. Make sure you receive prayer. Thank you for joining us. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on Instagram and Facebook. And listen every morning, Monday through Friday at 7.47 a.m. as we go through the Bible together on Facebook Live. And share these videos with all your friends and family so others can receive the hope of Jesus.